I would like now to introduce the EY kind of core blockchain technology R&D team. And this next uh, conversation is really all about how we are achieving privacy and efficiency on the mainnet. Um, I, I, it is hard for me to say adequately how proud I am of this amazing team, right? They have, uh, we have been working on this idea of having privacy on public blockchains for pretty much four years now. And the, the team, every single person on this team who got into this, they, they got started, they, uh, they said initially, this is incredibly challenging. And instead of being deterred by the challenge, they have been energized by it. And the progress that we have made you know, in, in about 18 months, we went from $100 a transaction prototype to under five cents is staggering. It blows away uh, a, a lot of other benchmarks. And I think the strength of this has to do with the strength of our team and, and their focus. And so uh, I, I really take my hat off. I thought I was good at math in college. Turns out not even remotely close to the standard of this team. So with that, I want to hand it over to Chitanya Konda, who is joining us from Hyderabad to get us started. Chitanya, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I work in the r and team, as Paul suggested, along with uh, Duncan, Mike, uh, Miranda, and Yusuf. Uh, before we start off, I'd like to ask everybody for a quick moment of silence for the EY Blockchain Shoe 2020 that never came to exist, uh, either because it couldn't be present here with us or because it couldn't fit onto the Zoom screen. Uh, but you can see some of the pictures of our world famous blockchain shoes from the prior version from the prior versions of the summit right behind me. Uh, we all dearly miss the shoe this year. Okay, now moving on to the topic of our conversation. Um, we're going to talk about achieving privacy but efficiently so on an Ethereum mainnet or any sort of public blockchain. If you all remember back in the October 2018, we did using Nightfall private transactions to transfer assets between two parties, um, which costed, costed us about $100. Uh, but in the subsequent year, we brought that cost down, uh, way down to about $10 with changes to the implementation of Merkle Tree uh, using something called Timber and uh, changing things in terms of the number of public inputs that we would have to use for our proofs. Um, and even further on, uh, we brought that cost down to about 20 cents um, with using mechanisms such as batching our proofs. So today we're going to talk a bit about all of these changes that we've done in the recent year to make privacy uh, much more efficient in terms of cost and also in terms of proof generation um, and later on also explore uh, topics such as uh, regulatory compliance with privacy as well as uh, private co business computation logic that we're going to uh, we're currently working on. So firstly uh, this is the agenda for today uh, but we're going to start off with proof batching. Why do we require proof batching? We're going to compare uh, a normal transfer with two kinds of batching uh, to see why, what exactly are the benefits here. So for a normal private transfer today, it costs about 50 cents and we can do about portion of those transactions on the blockchain. A block has about a 10 million uh, gas limit and each of these transactions, as you can see, the normal transfer costs about 690k gas. So we are able to do about 14 of those transactions. Now, talking about the first kind of batching transaction, uh, which is roll-up, we can do about uh, 40 of those transactions because it only costs about 248k gas, and which, which basically means it's about 20 cents, uh, which is a very good improvement uh, further from a normal transfer. And um, talking about the second kind of batching mechanism, which is the recursive transfer here, uh, that costs even way lesser, which is about seven cents, uh, because the gas cost for that required is about 99,000 on chain. And we can do about 64 of that because it fits so much into a 10 million block gas limit. As you notice from a normal transfer, the different kinds of batching uh, mechanisms, we are not only bringing down the cost, but there's also scalability efficiency that we gain uh, from 14 to 64. Um, so these are the obvious benefits of being able to batch. Uh, but also another add-on benefit, which is a very huge uh, uh, Pro is that not only does this sort of batching mechanism help us with reducing costs, but it also get, helps us get flexible circuits to execute private business logic that we might want in, in, in the future um, to a degree. So we're going to explore 
for different types of batching further. Um, and in order to do so, we will look at the example of doing 16 transfers between two parties. Um, today, with a normal private transfer without any sort of batching, in order to do that, we'll take the example of in order to transfer $15 from uh, me to Dunlop. Um, in terms of a private token. Uh, let's say I have two private tokens of $10 each. So I would like to send $15 uh, token to Paul and retain the change of five tokens to myself. Um, in order to do that, I will first have to create a proof, a proof that um, proves various statements such as that I actually own two $10 private tokens and that I can prove that it, this exists on the blockchain uh, without losing privacy, without pointing what those two tokens are on the blockchain. Um, and also nullify these tokens that I hold because I shouldn't be double spending them after that. Um, and also create two new tokens of 15 and $5 uh, values each, uh, such that the summation of the output values is equal to the summation of the input values in complete. Um, and in doing all of this uh, as a proof together, uh, I can do one transfer, but in order to make that transfer actually happen, I would have to verify that proof on the blockchain. Um, so now that is one transfer, if I'd like to do 16 of those transfers, I would have to create 16 of those proofs and verify 16 of them on chain. So you can do the math with 16 into 52 cents, uh, that's what it's going to cost us uh, with 16 verifications on chain. And that proof generation time is about five minutes today. Uh, and the proof generation is completely off chain. Uh, so we're gonna look at uh, a batching mechanism, which is roll up, where roll up is about taking one coin and making multiple payments with that one coin. Uh, so in this example, we look at making uh, 20 transactions of $1 payments with $20 coin. Um, so obviously all of this will be held within one proof where the only change in statement that you will have to prove over the prior statements is that the output token values of all of these 20 is equal to the input token value of 20. Um, and in that proof generation should take you about uh, 13 minutes. Uh, but the thing I'd like to highlight here is that that 13 minutes also includes something called a consolidation proof generation because in order to make a roll up proof generation happen, uh, you're expecting that you have a coin big enough to make these 20 payments. In most situations, you might end up in situations where you do not have a coin of that big value. So you would first have to consolidate the smaller denomination tokens that you have uh, to come up with a token that big. So we're looking at both a consolidation proof and a, and a payment transfer proof uh, together, which takes about a good uh, 13 minutes of proof generation, which is not too much. Um, so that is, uh, in that case, it would be two proofs in chain and uh, to be verified with two proofs of chain um, in total. That would be roll up. And we're looking at the first uh, kind of recursive batching that we have. We have something called a one level recursive batching where we're gonna take all of those proofs that we have from our, our normal transfer, 16 proofs, and instead of verifying them on chain, we're going to put them all into an other proof that we call the outer proof and verify them all 16 inside the outer proof. So now you have this big one proof that holds all of these 16 proofs and it is only that proof that we will then have to verify on chain. So in theory, you're creating 16 proofs plus one but you, and you're doing 16 off-chain verifications plus one on-chain verification, which is why, which is why the costs are, are still way lower uh, with, with batching over a normal transfer. Um, and in this case, the proof generation would take us about nine to 10 minutes, and uh, you're just having to verify one on chain. Uh, finally, we're gonna talk about something called a log N recursive batching, as opposed to the le uh, one level recursive batching that we talked earlier. The difference here is we're going to batch in a log N mechanism up a tree, which means we're gonna take two proofs at a time and batch them into one proof. So you're gonna take two transfer proofs, batch it into one, take another two transfer proofs, batch it into another, and take these two newly generated proofs and batch them once again. So you're gonna repeat this process all the way until you get one proof out of all the proofs that, proofs that you wanted to batch. And now, uh, in the case of a 16 transfer example, you would be generating 31 proofs, 30 of which will be verified on chain with only one verified on chain. So it is just for that one proof that you're actually having to pay at the end. Um, and the proof generation time here is about 24 minutes. Um, and it's not an apples to apples comparison between a log end to a one level recursive batching because we're, we're gonna use a slightly different kind of curve here called the MNT curves, which lets you do uh, cyclical recursive proofs, which aren't possible with the same curves that you use for one level batching 
which is why the proof generation time is a little bit higher because uh, um, of the difference in the amount of bits in the other pair that we're using here. Uh, but the major plus for a recursive batching or a one level batching is that um, you can batch any number of proofs with a recursive batch and batch them on the fly into one proof. Whilst with a one level batching, you need to predefine the number of transfers you'd like to make. So if you wanna make 20 transfers as opposed to 16 transfers, you need a different circuit, which reads a different trusted setup. Uh, so there's a bit of complexity and a rigidity around uh, the other kind of batching mechanism. Now, my colleague Yusuf will go deeper into one level recursive batching. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Youssef, I'm part of the Global Blockchain team and I'm based in Paris. So as um, Chaitanya was talking about, uh, we can do those uh, proof batching with one level recursive batching or log n recursive batching. So just to put, to put it into context, we've been talking about zero knowledge proofs, but what we are doing precisely is uh, zero pairing based zero knowledge proofs for NP language. So NP language means that you can prove somewhat any statements you want. And the fact that we want to verify a proof is also an NP statement. So we can create a proof that verifies another proof or a proof that verifies many other proofs. Um, for instance, 16 proofs in our example. Um, and pairing based meaning that those uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs that we use require a special mathematical object that maybe uh, many of you might know as elliptic curves. So those elliptic curves should have an efficient operation that we call pair. So all we have to know is we need elliptic, special elliptic curves that we call pairing friendly elliptic curves. So if we look at uh, the literature and the state of the art uh, on what have been done uh, in this uh, up to now. So um, the idea of creating a proof that verifies another proof introduce a, an arithmetical uh, uh, mismatch, which means that the arithmetic to generate a proof do not match the, the arithmetic to verify a proof. So we do not need only one elliptic curve as we do in normal zero knowledge proofs, so precisely pairing based zero knowledge proofs, but we need maybe two elliptic curves or more, ideally two elliptic curves, so that we limit the number of elliptic curves. So there have been a proposition by Lipsnack, so a paper by uh, Chisa, Ben Sasson and others. So they introduced a cycle of elliptic curves, namely MNT4, MNT6. And the problem with this cycle is that the, secu the security is not good at all, but the performance are good. So in order to resolve this, whether we need to find another cycle, another pair of elliptic curves, but this is very unlikely to happen. Uh, there have been mainly negative results as to to find new cycles. And the other solution is to increase parameters. By, by increasing parameters, we lower the, the performance. So, uh, this, so this first cycle, MNT4, MNT6, uh, MNT6 is used in Lipsnark. The second one, so with uh, increased parameters, is used in, in, in Coda blockchain. Then there have been a relaxation of this idea and we only require this idea in order to aggregate this. We do not need a log n in some scenarios, as, as Shaitanya was, uh, was explaining, we need only, for example, one layer uh, batching. And for one layer batching, there have been a paper, Zexi, by, uh, again, Chisa, uh, Mishra, Bo, and others, that introduced two pair of elliptic curves. So those are in the diagram, so the, 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 the bottom left. And uh, those uh, elliptic curves, uh, can enable us to, 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 have this, uh, to, to have this recursion. What we have done at EY is a research paper and an open source implementation to have uh, a new pair of elliptic curves that is faster, way faster than the, the current state of the art. So, um, so uh, here uh, uh, there is the, the, the link of the research paper and the C++ open source implementation. And uh, in the paper, we have introduced many uh, new techniques uh, to, to, to make this uh, recursion and this aggregation faster. In the first table, uh, so here I just, for the sake of the time, I make uh, emphasis on the, the compression. So which means that because in, in Ethereum, we should, we should, for, we should uh, care of the size for scalability problems and the speed for gas cost. So for the scalability problem, we have a factor six of compression, which means that all the elements we, we use in the Ethereum are, 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 are compressed. And the second table is the theoretical uh, number of operations. So in comparison with Zexi and EY work. And 
uh, we see that uh, we, we need four uh, times, 4.4 times less uh, operations in order to achieve the verification of this uh, on-chain uh, on chain proof. So, um, uh, so the, the proof generation is also faster, but because the applications are different and the number of proofs are different, here we focus on the time of verification. So the time of the verification for Zexi to verify uh, uh, an aggregated proof, let's say a proof that verifies 16 proofs, is 0 0.17 seconds. And with EY work, it's called 0 0.02 seconds. So we have a factor of at least of six. So it is six times faster, which means that uh, cost-wise in Ethereum, it would be six times cheaper to, to use uh, our new uh, introduced curves to do uh, proof aggregation. So uh, the research paper is available. It is on ePrint IACR, and the implementation is also open source on uh, EY blockchain uh, GitHub. So uh, now I uh, give the mic to, to Miranda, who's going to talk about advanced hashes. Hash. Thank you very much. Yes, I will just share, and then I will talk about advanced hashing. So, yes, I want to talk about one, one of the ways we've improved efficiency in Nightfall. This is by adding uh, an optional switch, which changes the type of hash that uh, you can use in the way we store uh, commitments. So I'll just go through what, exactly what a commitment is and how we use it. So obviously we can't store the token itself on the blockchain who owns it. We instead represent it with a commitment. And the commitment is a hash of the note's value, its owner's public key, and a secret random number known as a salt. So to prove ownership of it, you must show that you can reproduce the same hash. Um, so to spend it, you need to prove that you own it. And also you need to prove that it exists in our public database. Um, so the question is, how do we store these, commi these commitments so a user can pick out their commitment efficiently? And the solution we use is something called a Merkle tree. So you may know what a Merkle tree is already. If not, I'll go through it quickly now. <clears throat> it's a type of data structure where we store information on the bottom row uh, in, in places known as leaves. And the whole data structure has one common value known as the root. And to work out this root, we hash each pair of leaves um, until we get to the top. So let's say, for example, we want to prove that our commitment, uh, commitment one, is in our database, the Merkle tree. First of all, you have to hash the if commitment with its neighbor to get the value we could call it A. We hash A with the value next to it, which is the hash of the two below. We hash those together to get one level up, and we keep going until we get to the root. So the great thing about uh, hash functions is you can think of them as like one-way functions. So if I told you the value of A, you wouldn't know uh, what commitments I used to create A. And since hashing those commitments together always results in the same value A, it gives this really nice result. So that means the calculation of the root of the Merkle tree can only be correct if every single input is correct. So it's a great way to prove that something you own is in our database without having to download the whole thing. But the thing is, there's a lot of hashing going on here. This example only has four rows up to the top, but uh, our real Merkle tree has 32 rows. So there's a lot of hashing. So we have to be careful about what hash function we use. Uh, the most common hash function probably used out there is SHA-256, it's, it's a great one. We use it to create the commitment. So when we hash the value of public key and the salt together, we use SHA to uh, create that. And we also use it to work out the public key from a private key. The problem with it is it's very computationally expensive when used in zero knowledge proofs, which really, really slows stuff down. So I'll just go through uh, how many hashes we really need to prove that you own just one commitment. So first of all, you need to calculate the public key from a secret key. So that's one hash. Then we need to calculate the commitment using that information, its token value and the salt. And then we need to calculate the root from the commitment and something called a sibling path, which is all the values you need to uh, hash up to the root. So they're all circled in red here. And finally, you need to check that the root matches the one that is in our stored public Merkle tree that everybody knows. We need to do all of this in zero knowledge. So even though there's only 30, 34 hashes we need to do, it actually adds up to quite a lot of computational power. And as Titania was talking about, if we wanted to do a consolidation proof and uh, prove that, say you own a lot of commitments and you want to prove that 20 are in the tree without having, having to submit 20 individual proofs, you'd need 680 hashes in the proof. Um, so with SHA, that actually makes the proof too large to compute. So we decided to look at another way of hashing up the Merkle tree to try and make it more affordable in 
are more efficient in science, but also affordable in gas costs. So we did some searching around and we came up with a MIMC or mimic hashing. So let's have a look at how it compares. So SHA hashing, which uh, is the, probably the most commonly used, it's good because it is uh, cheap to set up and use on Ethereum. However, it's uh, not very great, not very good in SNARKs, in uh, zero knowledge proofs. And it does require some workarounds, so it requires some bit conversion as well. So it uses up one and a half thousand gas for one hash on Ethereum, which is not too bad, but uh, it does take up 27,000 constraints in the proof. Uh, the more constraints that are used in a zero knowledge proof, the longer it will take to compute. So going to Mimic, which is what we eventually chose, you can see it's very efficient in uh, SNARKs in zero knowledge proofs. It only needs 730 constraints, a tiny fraction. However, um, it does take quite a lot of gas. It takes 40,000 gas to do a single hash. It doesn't need any bit conversions though, so that's good. Another hash type we looked at was something called Pedersen hashes. They're also very efficient in SNARKs, uh, 680 constraints, quite similar. However, the issue is that there isn't really a Ethereum implementation out there. It's not very widely used because we need to add a different elliptic curve in solidity to Ethereum, which is a lot of work to do. So working out the gas cost of that is a bit more difficult. So to summarize, we eventually went for Mimic because it's efficient enough to um, enable, zero, enable consolidation proofs in uh, SNARKs, whereas SHA is not. It's not too expensive to be used in Ethereum, on the Ethereum virtual machine, um, whereas, Pe whereas Pedersen is not, and it's secure enough to prove membership in a Merkle tree. So let's have a look at some of the results we've seen, because we have now implemented Mimic into Nightfall, so that uh, the user can decide whether they want to use SHA hashing or uh, mimic hashing when they hash up the root, because obviously there's a trade-off there between uh, gas cost and proving time. Now I'll just point out a uh, transfer, for example. So with SHA, it takes five minutes uh, to, do, to prove ownership of one commitment and transfer it. But with mimic, it only takes 47 seconds, which is really, really fast, an 84% reduction of time. Similarly, to burn a commitment to sort of withdraw your money, uh, it takes 78% less time, which is great. But perhaps the most exciting thing is that we can now do a consolidation proof. Uh, we can prove we own 20 commitments at once in a single proof and a single Ethereum transaction in nine and a half minutes, which is less than twice the amount of time it takes for sure to, be, to prove that you have one commitment in transfer. So that's a really, really great result for us. And with that, I will hand it over to Duncan, who will talk about regulatory compliance and privacy. So regulatory compliance, please. Please don't all turn off. This is uh, more fun than it might actually sound at first. Um, the thing is, uh, mathematicians are actually, uh, they're a literal bunch. Um, when they say zero knowledge, they really mean zero. So if you do a transaction under zero knowledge and, and you do it correctly, you, uh, other people will learn absolutely nothing about your transaction. They won't know what you transferred, they won't know who transferred it, and they won't know who you transferred it to. They will just simply know that a transfer of funds happened. Um, so that's real strong privacy. That's great. That's, that's what we want, isn't it? Um, and the answer to that is actually not always. Um, if you're, you, if you're the owner of a stable coin, it's a bit of an issue actually, because your stable coin will be backed by some real securities. It might be um, bars of gold in a warehouse or, or something a little bit more subtle than that. Um, but nevertheless, it means you will fall squarely under the auspices of your local regulator, the SEC, in the United States or the FCA in the UK. Um, and what does that mean? Well, that means you have to do certain things. You're legally required to have anti-money laundering procedures in place, um, and you're legally obliged to make KYC checks. Now, and other things, of course, but uh, let's focus on these. Now, if you're if you're in a position where you're using zero knowledge proof and uh, the regulator or somebody else comes along with the court order and says, I need to know what uh, a certain person is doing or a certain account, I need to know what that transfer was, and here's a court order that says you've got to tell me. Um, 
throwing your hands up and saying, well, it's all done under zero knowledge, so I don't know, is and, unless you like prison food, is not a great strategy. Uh, so we started to think about that. We started to think, how can you retain all the benefits of zero knowledge um, and yet still be able to comply with regulations? Um, and when we looked at anti-money laundering and know your customer, we thought, actually, the, there's two things you need to do. And we've, we've verified this with the compliance officers of, uh, of stable coins. So we think this is correct. Um, we don't guarantee you'll stay out of prison if you do this, but um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's uh, the way we see the future. So um, one of the things you have to have is you have to have a level of transaction visibility. You have to be able to answer questions that are put but to you by legal authorities. Um, the other thing you have to do is you have to be able to stop malfeasance from transacting. So the question then becomes, how do we do those two things under zero knowledge um, without compromising privacy more than we inevitably have to? So let's look at the let's look at the first one first. Um, how do we provide transaction visibility? Well, the way we do it is, is this. When you do a zero knowledge transaction, the smart contract actually requires you to encrypt details of your transaction. And by details, I mean what was sent, who it was sent from and who it was sent to. So very simply, it, it requires you to encrypt that and put an encrypted blob on the on the blockchain. Um, the only person who has the keys to that would be the compliance officer who is legally required to be able to decrypt that. So you've you've absolutely minimized any privacy exposure in doing that. Uh, but there are a number of issues with that. I mean, uh, just because I give a smart contract a blob of encrypted data, how does the smart contract know that that data is actually a correct encryption. In other words, it's decryptable um, without decrypting it. And if I was to decrypt it, it would contain the information that it's supposed to contain. Now, obviously, a smart contract can't check any of those things, because if the smart contract could decrypt something, then it, everyone would see the, the, the content. So that's no good. So what we require you to do is to create a proof a zero knowledge proof that you have in fact encrypted the data that you are supposed to encrypt correctly. And then the smart contract can verify that proof and it doesn't need to decrypt that data. And in fact, it doesn't get decrypted unless the compliance officer is required legally to decrypt it. So you've really, I think, got the best of both worlds there. You've got real privacy, but you've got the you've got the ability to comply with um, any legal, any um, regulatory requirements you may be enforced to, to do. So that's the first part. I should say at this point, I'm not a lawyer. So um, anything I say that appears to be legal advice, uh, just remember I'm a blockchain engineer and don't take it as such. Um, the second thing we need to do is we need to be able to stop malfeasance from transacting. And, and actually what that means is a particular Ethereum address cannot transact. Um, how do we do that under zero knowledge? Well, the way we do it is we create a whitelist, a whitelist of people who are allowed to transact. Um, but what we don't want to do is we don't want everyone to have to go through some sort of signing on process so they can be added to the whitelist and start using the system. That's that's not really in the spirit of things. Um, so what we actually do is we allow anyone to add themselves to that whitelist. And uh, that whitelist is stored in a Merkle tree, just like the Merkle trees that Miranda was talking about. Um, and you can do that provided your address isn't in a blacklist. Um, and, and having added yourself to the whitelist, whenever you want to 
transact, you will be required to prove in zero knowledge that you are on the whitelist. In other words, you don't have to say, I'm Duncan, look, there, that's where I am on the whitelist. You just have to prove, I'm not saying who I am, but I am on the whitelist. And the, and the zero knowledge proof can enable the smart contract to check that. Um, if we blacklist you, if we decide that you're not behaving for whatever reason, um, you would be removed from that whitelist and added to the blacklist. And now you're stuck because you can no longer create a zero knowledge proof that you're on the whitelist because you're not. You can't add yourself back to the whitelist because the smart contract will see that you're on the blacklist and will prevent you from doing that. Um, so you've got a uh, perfect blacklisting and, and that address will no longer be able to transact under zero knowledge. So we think with those two things, we've, you know, this is always a balance, of course it is. You, you, it's a balance between privacy and doing what you have to do to be legal. And uh, this is our take on that. Um, I can just quickly, I can just quickly show you that if I may, I'll just, um, I'll just swap to um, my application and keep you a second. Um, there we go. Right. Um, this, uh, if you've ever used Nightfall, uh, you will recognize this sort of screen. This is the compliance administrator screen in Nightfall. And we will imagine that this transaction, and this is a transaction hash of an Ethereum transaction on the blockchain, uh, we are interested in that. Now, anyone looking at that transaction will just see what are essentially random numbers. They'll see a commitment hash and an encryption. And yeah, for all intents and purposes, they, those are random numbers. They give you no information. Um, but having the compliance administrator's private key, um, I can actually decrypt that. I need to tell it it's a transfer transaction, but uh, that is also apparent from the blockchain. So we're not giving anything away there. Um, I decrypt and there we are. I can actually see that a sender called A has sent uh, seven ERC20 tokens um, to themselves actually. So uh, that is actually a useful transaction to do under ZKP. I, I, I can't go into why now, but uh, you can see how it is possible actually if you need to, to provide that information. So there we are, that's a, a quick uh, run through of um, me while I just do the screen share again. Uh, that's just a quick run through of, of how it works. Um, that is now in Nightlight, our zero knowledge proof library. You can download it, you can use it. If you want to use this approach, you set it by environment variables um, and it will you do the compliance version. If you don't want to use that, if you want full privacy, you can do that too. Okay. Um, Right, now we're on to the second part of our presentation. Uh, originally, this was billed as a breakout session, but um, as we're all kind of at home at the moment, uh, we'll just follow straight on. So we're going to talk about two pieces of software that we've recently released. They're, they're open source, public domain. In fact, you can, you can just use them. In fact, everything we've talked about up to now is stuff that's out there on GitHub. So you can go and use it and you can uh, have fun with it. The last part of this talk, uh, private contracts, that is more about our research direction. We hope you find it interesting, but it's it's kind of stuff we're thinking about right now. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Nightlight and I'll pass on to some of my colleagues for the other parts. So Nightlight. So um, one of the problems we have is uh, when we released Lightfall uh, a year ago, it showcased how you could do zero knowledge proofs on an Ethereum blockchain. And that's what we needed. We need to show people it could be done in a practical way. Now, a year later, we're kind of getting to the point where actually, you know, we're thinking about putting these things into production. And when you want to put something into production, having a complete application is probably not what you want. Um, because you'll be building your own production application and, and you, you need to slot the functionality of Nightfall into that. And it's 
to, to say use nightfall is rather like if you wanted to build a house, me saying, well, there's another house over there. You can take it to bits and use the bricks from it. What you actually want is a, a pile of bricks. So uh, we're giving you a pile of bricks. Uh, that's nightlight. Nightlight is a library. It extracts all of the zero knowledge proof components out of nightfall and leaves all the boring sort of bits like the UE and the database that any application has behind. So uh, you can now use Nightlight in your own applications to do zero knowledge proof transfers of value. Um, there's a second piece of software which we'll talk about later called Timber, which you may or may wish to use with Nightlight and, and you can if you want to, but I'll, I'll focus on Nightlight for the moment. So Nightlight is pretty easy to install. It's a node application. You can install it with NPM and bang, it's in your application. Really that simple. Um, because we're doing zero knowledge proofs, you have to do a trusted setup. Uh, that's easy. As you, as you know, Nightfall uses, uh, and Nightlight, use Socrates under the hood, a uh, most excellent piece of code. Um, and we can uh, do a trusted setup simply by calling this function. This is in the documentation you'll, you'll see. Having done that, uh, Nightlight will compile a set of uh, files that it needs from the original proof descriptions in the Socrates DSL. It'll compile a proving key and a verification key. And from that point on, you'll be able to call the bint transfer and burn functions in Nightlight to do transfers with any ERC20 or 721 contract that you might have um, completely under zero knowledge. So I, I hope you'll, you'll have a look at that in GitHub and, and give it a go and, uh, and tell us what you think about it. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Miranda now, who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, Timber. Great, thank you, Duncan. So I will be talking about the solution we came up with to efficient commitment storage. So as I said before, our favorite topic, Merkle trees are used to store commitments um, efficiently. And just as a refresher from a few minutes ago, we have to calculate the commitment from um, value, the public key and the salt. We then calculate the route from the commitment and the sipping path. And then we have to check that with the one in the database. Now, in reality, we don't have four rows. This example just has four rows up to the root. In reality, we have 32 rows. And so we don't have 16 slots to store commitments. We have over 4 billion, which is far too much to store on the blockchain. So what do we do instead? Well, this is where Timber comes in. And Timber was thought up by our colleague, Michael. And he very cleverly thought of a way to uh, store the bare minimum information on chain while ensuring that the route could be updated whenever a commitment is correctly minted and only then to ensure that nobody puts fake commitments in our database and to ensure that nobody gets the wrong route. Most of the data is stored off chain. So I'm gonna quickly go through what it would look like if we were just to fill up our Merkle tree without any clever shortcuts just naively and there's a lot of hashing going on here so every time a connection appears we need to compute a hash and update the value now on chain this would the gas cost would really pile up um, so it really is quite inefficient and if you notice when i add a um, say number 30 no number 30 it doesn't touch the left side of the tree at all so this kind of concept is used in timber so instead of doing it naively, we store something called a frontier, which is on the left. Uh, the frontier is only the size of one path. So in this case, it's four, because we have four hashes to do before we get to the root. And in our case, it's actually 32. Um, so let's say that we've minted a commitment and we have a completely empty database for the market tree and we want to add it. So it comes up here. We then need to calculate the root. So we take all the siblings and hash it up. So because it's empty, all the values right now are zero. So we just hash whatever is in 15, our commitment, with zero to get what's in seven, hash that with zero to get what's in three, and so on. We don't actually need to store any of this on chain. We store the root so you can later prove that you own the commitment, but we don't have to store anything else in the middle apart from one element in the frontier. The calculation is done on chain so you know it's right, but you don't need to actually uh, store everything. So, I will, there we are. But you only need to store your commitment, the one in the bottom row, because that's actually the only thing you need 
to work out what the route will be when you add another commitment. So let's say someone else, someone else comes along and um, mints a commitment, and it, when added to the Merkle tree, it will look like this. So we hash it with the commitment next to it, and we instead of and we update the value in node number seven, and we update the value above that until we get to the root. We didn't actually need anything else to work out the root and add a commitment properly. The full pass is still stored off chain, but on chain, all we needed was one value. That was the value in 15. So on the next run, we're not going to be updating what's in number seven because it's the hash of two commitments below, which we're not going to change. So we store that in the front here as well, and it's corresponding level. Now, if we add another commitment, number 17, we hash that with a zero to get whatever it is in eight. We hash eight with the stored seven, and then we update again. We re, re um, fill what is in three and one, and then we get the root. Um, so in the interest of time, I will quickly click through and see, and hopefully that makes sense, and see how it works. So here when we add a new one, we need to update uh, what's stored in the front here. We no longer store the first commitment, we store the third, which is, known, which is number 17 here, because we need that to add number 80, and so on and so forth. So we're only storing a maximum of four things at a time. So it really is a lot more efficient. So let's so say we add the last commitment. We only actually need four values. We need the value in 29, we need the value in uh, 13, we need the value of five, we need the value in one. We don't need the whole tree stored on chain. The key point is we only store values that we need to know uh, or adding the next commitment along. Everything else is stored off chain to retrieve the full paths later. So that might sound a little bit complicated, but let's see how it looks all in tandem. So Duncan talked about Nightlight before, which has a zero knowledge proof uh, logic. And this communicates right now with Timber, which solves that storage problem. So going through the process of a mint, for example, when you create a commitment, you create a proof using the zero knowledge proof logic in Nightlight. Right now, the uh, smart contracts are in Nightfall. That's gonna change soon. And uh, a smart contract verifies that proof. Once that verification has gone through, Nightlight tells Timber to add the commitment which it does, and it, um, it goes through that process previously. It then emits an event, which updates the route stored in the smart contract, and it updates its own route as well. And you can find out about um, all of these, <coughs> Nightlight and Timber, which are both used in, for example, an EY project called TaxWave, they're both plugged in, um, and our GitHub sites. And the key thing is, with Timber, um, if we didn't have, if we just filled it up naively, we could be filling up to over 8.5 billion uh, data points on chain, but instead we store sort of 33 at the most, which is a really great step. And with that, I will hand over to Titania, who will talk about private contracts and some of our future work. Yes, thank you, Miranda. I hope you can see my screen. Okay, she says yes. Um, so what we've talked so far uh, with Duncan, Miranda, uh, Yusuf and I are research pieces that we've already successfully implemented and made open source and open source and publicly available for everybody um, to access and clone um, and, and use it in their own code base. What we're going to talk now is the current uh, focus of our research, um, which revolves around how to make complex business logic private. Uh, by that I mean Today we can do private transfers of tokens and tokenized assets um, from one party to another. But we would also like to take that a, a big step further and make that possible for any sort of business um, logic computation. Um, and because that sort of logic computation actually happens over the contracts in the blockchain, so we're not just looking at private contracts, but uh, private business computation, but also being able to do that on the blockchain, hence private contracts. Um, so with that, being the objective, can we make uh, uh, any smart contract private? To answer that, we're looking at five different areas of research. Uh, we're going to delve into each of this uh, one by one in a minute. Trusted setups, making future edits to the protocol and hidden function being called modularizing snarks and Turing completeness. Um, so firstly, trusted setups. Um, any function that requires uh, to be proved on chain privately requires its own circuit, which means its own proof. Um, and 
each of these proofs needs something called a proving key as well as a verification key, which are generated using something called a trusted setup. Uh, and the trusted setup takes into its input something called a toxic parameter, which if not discarded properly, um, people who can use it, uh, people would be able to use it to generate fake proofs um, on the blockchain. Um, which means you can create uh, fines out of thin air, money out of thin air. So we would want to make sure that doesn't happen. So we use something called a, a multi-party computation, um, which means a lot of people are actually involved in the generation of these skills. And together, if all of these people in the, in the multi-party computation actually collude, only can they th then generate the fake proof, uh, but otherwise they wouldn't be able to do so. So even if there's one honest party, they can't do that. And um, so in order to do this ceremony of multi-party computation, you can imagine you need a lot of people uh, to make sure you know, a lot of people can't collude. Fewer people are probably able to collude much more easily. Um, so it's going to be expensive to do that. It's going to be logistically difficult to do that. So we want to avoid that because we need a lot of different logic that we would want to be able to prove on chain. And we can't be trusted set up for each of them. Um, so we're looking at something called the universal trusted setups where you would only have to do trusted setup one time for any kind of function. Um, but you never would have to do it again. Uh, whilst the trust setup today, you would need a new trust setup for every circuit, everything that you want to prove on chain. Uh, we're also looking at trustless setups with transparency marks where you do not have to have a trusted setup at all, but you would do something called a trustless setup. So that's, that's our research in terms of trusted setup. We're looking at being able to make edits to protocols. Uh, what I mean by edits to protocols is any sort of business logic um, you express it as a bunch of cryptographic statements uh, within your SNARK. And so that in itself is called a protocol. Once you have this protocol, it becomes rather rigid once deployed to the blockchain to change. So you want to get rid of this rigidity to have flexible contracts so you can update these contracts in the need of uh, bug fixes or for new functionality if users want uh, uh, different uh, features to be implemented, different new use cases to be implemented. So you should be able to make changes to these protocols once deployed. But we want to be able to do that with some of these uh, these features, which is where our own brain research is. Um, you want to be able to do such that you do not have to have a new trust set up every time you need a different kind of statement to be proven for the same tokens that are being spent on chain. Um, you, you should be able to have minimal amount of trusted setup. But also, if you do uh, generate a token, private tokens with one kind of uh, protocol uh, or proof, you should be able to have backwards compatibility to those commitments with new proofs that you will, you will in the future accept or make edits with. Um, and also, you should be able to do all of this while still keeping the anonymity set large enough and not losing your anonymity, which is a reduction in privacy. Um, Another thing we're looking at is uh, hiding which function has been called on the smart contract in the, in the blockchain. Um, it's not a major problem today if, if a function, if a particular company is calling a particular function, you're not really revealing the confidential data held within. Um, and to, to an extent, you would be able to figure out these sorts of functions or these sorts of business logic are being called by these kinds of companies with, with some sort of probability. Uh, but in a, in a perfect scenario, probably you even want to avoid uh, having that minimal leak of data. Or in some cases, even that data might be critical that you don't want to leak it. Um, so in order to avoid that, we want to hide the function that's being called. So the, the function being the private computation that is being called. And to do so, these are the hurdles we have today. You should be able to hide the circuit or function or business logic specific verification keys being used, you should be able to hide the public inputs, the number of public inputs and the public inputs themselves that are being added to the blockchain. Um, and some of these public inputs within them hold private information. And, and to do all of this, our ongoing research, research is in terms of how do you hide the verification keys? And also how do you use some sort of cryptographic accumulators where you, you take all of these public inputs and accumulate them into a sort of accumulator. So every time a new uh, input is being added to this set, um, you're just replacing the accumulator uh, without revealing what has been added or how many has been added. Um, another approach would be the one level smart grid version or, or so we've talked earlier, where um, your business logic specific proof itself is proved inside a bigger proof, um, which is called the outer proof, where you're just verifying this very specific business logic, but 
uh, with nothing else. So that final tooth, you're just verifying a tooth, but nothing, you're really not revealing the business logic specific statements themselves. Um, so that would be another approach to do. Uh, and we're looking into it at the moment. Uh, we're also looking at modularizing SNARKs where you must have realized a lot of the tools that you generate have very standard components that are used in building them in, in their entirety. Um, they, that would be multiple sync, inclusion proofs, access, SNARK verification, elliptic curve cryptography being um, so your signatures or your encryption mechanism, and also accumulator proofs and so forth. That's, that's pretty much what your proofs contain today. So we're looking at a way to compose your SNARK, a SNARK being a proof end-to-end, uh, -end, such that it is built up of these different standard blocks. Um, and each of those proofs is verified one after the other uh, in a recursive manner, like your log and recursion, for example. And all of these proofs in this recursive manner tie together to be one big proof. And the way you would link them all is such that your subsequent proof will receive all of its inputs in its entirety from a prior proof uh, only. So either the prior proof completely generates the inputs the subsequent proof wants, or it itself used the inputs and it passed on to the subsequent proof, and that's how you link them. Um, so that's another area where we're looking at doing um, complex business logic. Finally, you know, business logic involves you to be able to uh, execute various sort of situations where you require things such as while loops or dynamic loops or modular arithmetic, floating point numbers, time-based logic, and proving that a certain amount of time has elapsed. Um, in order to do all of that, uh, we are looking into various fields of research, a lot of which we've just discussed in our prior slides. Uh, but for example, in the case of a while loop or a dynamic loop, uh, let's say you are still using um, snarks one after the other recursively and linking them such that you're able to have a dynamic length of loop and not have to have a fixed length of loop. A fixed length of loop um, is what you are restricted to do, to do today because the circuit is static um, you need to predefine all the statements in its entirety that it needs to prove ahead. And so having dynamicness there um, doesn't really satisfy the requirement of SNARKs um, as it is today. So we're looking at different ways of handling that sort of dynamism. Um, and also we're looking into verifiable delay functions. So all of these are the various fields of research that we're currently looking at um, and we're working on to make the private business computation logic with private contracts possible. And hopefully we're looking at uh, giving you updates, uh, very positive updates in our next coming talks and, uh, and also upcoming summits to tell you how much ahead we've gone with this sort of research. And as usual, all of this will be made, um, will be done open source as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. That is everything for today. We are to answer any sort of uh, questions that you might have. Um, I think we have seven minutes more in the talk, so we might have some time for Q and A. But please correct me if I'm wrong. We we, we have a few questions here, Chitanya, which I I can answer. Um, they, they, so far, they've been around the um, the the compliance versions. So I'll I'll take those, and maybe some others will come in. Um, so, so this question is about the the ZKP module, i.e., um, uh, Nightlight, and it says, um, uh, is is it uh, interoperable with other DLT protocols? And let's say Quorum, HLF, Corda, Multichain, etc. Um, that's a, actually a very interesting question because my immediate reaction was to say, well, no, because it's kind of designed for Ethereum. Um, but actually, a lot of it is broadly applicable. So um, the, the zero knowledge proof bit kind of doesn't really care about the underlying blockchain. That will, you know, you can generate proofs, you can generate um, verifying keys, and, and that's independent of the blockchain. Um, where the blockchain suddenly starts to matter is you need an on-chain component that can manage the zero knowledge proof system if you like so it it knows how to verify proofs it knows how to get money from erc20 contracts and of course all of that is is very ethereum specific um so if you wanted to use it with something else you'd, you'd have to rewrite those smart contracts which kind of implies 
you need a blockchain that sort of has that Turing complete programmable capability that Ethereum does. And I'll probably get told it's not Turing complete now, but uh, never mind. You know what I mean. Um, so, so I, I would think Quorum because it's you know, it's basically Ethereum uh, based deep down. You'd probably be in with a shout. I think with the others, you'd have to do a, a, a fair bit of work. So, so that's that's my feeling on that. But interesting question. Um, another interesting question, and you know, a, a really a really good one. Oh, um, we've got a few more coming in. Um, uh, uh, so, so here's the question. Um, what is the coolest way you've seen ZK Snark tech leverage so far? What kind of application for it do you want to try to enable in the future? Anyone got any ideas, guys? I can think of one. I'm just not sure if you're at liberty to speak about that. The, the one that you recently were, were talking about, Duncan. Um, so, so uh, well, I think I think for me, yeah. So, so I I agree. I, so, I think you know, for stable coins, I think that's really interesting because you know, in many ways, a stable coin is a kind of grown up cryptocurrency I, that's how i like to think of it you know it has a lot of the features that that an enterprise client would be looking for you know they can't take the sort of forex risk that you would have if you used ethereum or, or even bitcoin directly um but it but the one bit missing of course is the privacy so if you combine that capability of a stable coin with with privacy then i i think you've you've really got something there so i can for me that's the most exciting bit um i think other interesting things have been where we're doing where we're getting towards private smart contracts so we're doing things that are actually much more complex than simply moving money around you know we're doing things like um calculating uh, volume discounts and proving that the volume discounts are actually correct, uh, that, that sort of thing. I think, you know, we're, we're on the verge of being able to do really good private smart contracts very easily. And we can't quite do that yet, but we can do it a bit. And for me, that is the thing that will take off, I think, in the next year. What do you guys think? Okay, uh, well, I've got another few questions. Um, so I've heard privacy mentioned many times as a primary focus for UI and baseline protocol. Do you think a traditional level of privacy that obscures transactional information, such as company A sends X dollars to B, will be sufficient to meet the needs of enterprises? Will it be necessary to be able to do private computations on encrypted data as well? Oh, yeah, so excellent question. Um, so uh, that that really i think plays into my last point uh yes it definitely will uh, i think you know sending money around is fun um especially if you're sending it to me but it, really to you know if we're going to get real power out of the ethereum blockchain we need to do more than that you know we need to be able to be executing really complex business logic under zero knowledge um, and I absolutely see that as the future. And I hope sitting here in a year's time, um, we'll be talking about how that's getting on and finding out it's getting on quite well. Um, that's my sincere hope and belief anyway. New thoughts from anyone else there? <coughs> Excuse me. No. Yes. Well, I think we're, sorry, go on, Chitanya. Uh, Okay, I think we're about at time. So uh, there's a few more questions coming in, but uh, I guess we'll we'll have to take those offline. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Yes, and, and Duncan, Chitanya, Miranda, Yusuf, thank you guys so much. Uh, your contributions are amazing. And I, I, I share with you guys that this aspiration that a year from now, this is what we'll be talking about, which is how we industrialize 
first privacy for transfers and then privacy for business logic. So to me, that's incredibly important. I also want to thank you for what I think is the best possible kind of contribution to a future EY slogan that we could have, right? I, you said it very nicely. We don't guarantee it, but you're less likely to go to prison. And I, I don't know about you, but I think we have EY's new enterprise corporate slogan, less likely to go to prison. Um, with that, I want to welcome back our guest stars, Hudson Jameson and Christine Kim. And uh, let's, uh, I've got a bunch of questions for you guys, but before we get started, uh, maybe Christine, I just want to start with you, share your, your thoughts and reactions. And I, I know we were chatting uh, uh, online and I think you got a question lined up for Hudson as well. Definitely. I thought overall the session was not only very technically engaging, but that the topics it touched on went much went way beyond just technology. We touched on regulation. We touched on how privacy actually enhances efficiency on the blockchain. And I think that's really important to consider that this topic of privacy goes beyond just technology. It does touch on a, on a lot of other areas of, of pain points sometimes for blockchains when it comes to scalability and just speed of transactions. Um, so it was really interesting to get to know and learn more about that. Um, I actually thought that a lot of the terminology that was said during the discussion uh, were, were terms that I've heard in other discussions by developers and specifically Ethereum developers when they're talking about building uh, the new iteration of the Ethereum blockchain, Ethereum 2.0. Um, so I, one of the questions that I had and I wanted to shoot over to you, Hudson, was um, is it true that uh, uh, people, blockchain developers who are, who are helping design Ethereum 2.0 are also looking at very similar concepts uh, such as Merkle trees or batching. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you about uh, whether or not you had the same sense of, hey, I know some of these terms. Hey, these are things that I'm working on too. Yeah, I had that like classic, like, I think it's like a meme where they're like, I know some of these words, but um, uh, really <laughs> what's, what's happening is um, things like Merkle trees and um, like pre-compiles and BLS signature curves, those are all things that go into both ETH 1.0 and 2.0. However, what they're doing in ETH 2.0 is they're optimizing all of that. They're making it so that the gas costs are cheaper for uh, different things that are required to run these zero knowledge proofs. They are making things that are uh, more like they're making the storage costs uh, better and more efficient. Uh, and also with the scalability that includes uh, blockchain sharding, that's going to really help uh, with scalability of the entire thing. So to answer your question, yes, uh, those are things that they're being very much improved upon in ETH 2.0. And I actually have something for Christine. Very cool. um, real quick. Uh, and my question to Christine, because I know you do a lot of research and uh, analysis at, at Coindesk. What is your like favorite use case that you've seen? It can be an old one or a new one, boring or exciting, but what's your favorite use case for blockchain? I hope it's a, an exciting one. I hope what people think about my answer is that it is exciting. Um, I will say that my favorite use case for blockchain seems to change almost every single year or every six months because there's so much development happening in the space. But one of the most recent uh, use cases that I've found myself spending so much time researching, so much time looking into as a research analyst is decentralized finance. DeFi has just exploded across um, in terms of hype on, on the Ethereum blockchain and uh, the amount of value of, of total ETH going into DeFi applications has really skyrocketed. And I think it's been interesting to see its development and growth over the years, its maturation and how it's responded to um, major developments in the market. So I'm thinking specifically to the March 12th price crash. Um, that I think was a huge turning point for, for a specific DeFi application maker DAO. Um, so watching how DeFi is evolving right now is, is one of my favorite things to watch uh, in blockchain. So Christine and, and, and Hudson, I, you know, you, you brought up this topic of DeFi and, you know, DeFi is a good example of where you're taking money, you're turning it into kind of system based Lego building blocks and you're adding business logic, whether it's loans or, or, or insurance or other services. The thing that's really challenging that we've been thinking about a lot is under baseline, we want to be able to move DeFi with privacy because DeFi today 
is the most important thing. I agree that it's the most important and exciting thing that's going on, but there's no privacy in DeFi. And so enterprises won't use it. The thing that I see is exceptionally challenging. And to me, it's the number one challenge that we're going to face. Transfers are now relatively straightforward. We have got the cost and the scalability of transfers under zero knowledge down. Business logic, not so much. Business, each time we build a piece of business logic under zero knowledge, it's a custom development, right? Where we spend quite a lot of time thinking about, like uh, you'll see in the next issue, uh, next, next uh, discussion, uh, baseline serves uh, enterprise corporate clients around volume discounts. And we spent quite a bit of time figuring out how do you en enable under zero knowledge, the business logic that supports keeping track of your total volume and correctly calculating the price. Zero knowledge, privacy, they are really hard. So how do, how do we get adoption of this technology more widely? Because uh, it's not nearly as easy as just coding solidity, which isn't easy itself. So I'd say that there, there's a few different things that you touched upon here. And one of the biggest ones were, how do you get adoption for these kind of things? And I actually just posted a tweet that said uh, a large issue with layer two tech, uh, like the breakthroughs and adoption and Ethereum is the lack of uh, like non-technical cheerleaders or advocates for this software that aren't actually building the thing. So um, you need one page explainers, you need memes, you need all kinds of things so that it gets more popularized. And uh, as like famous athletes and philanthropists and others jump on board with this stuff and jump on board with DeFi and things like they're taking, I think this one NBA player is taking their NBA contracts and like tokenizing it, for instance. Uh, that's a really neat use case. And if more people do that, it's going to really take mm -hmm. off. So uh, to answer your question, we need more people you know, using this who are ne not necessarily technical because these breakthroughs are really hard to understand. And especially when it comes to zero knowledge stuff, the business logic on chain is even harder to code than just, you know, the privacy aspect of transferring the tokens to begin with. Christine? Yeah, I have to agree with you, Hudson, there, that this kind of technology is really hard to understand. If we thought that wrapping people's brains around what even a blockchain is was difficult, trying to explain privacy on the blockchain is just magnitudes more um, complicated. And I think that... Um, having advocates and having more information also comes back to trying to increase user trust in these applications for privacy. I think the more people can trust that this actually will hold my data and hold transactions um, uh, in a surefire way where um, these the, the information won't be leaked or will be uh, somehow attacked, I think is a really important um, piece of the puzzle on how we're going to on how we're going to continue to develop and make this more widespread. I think a large part of increasing trust is watching the technology um, go through different difficult circumstances. So when it comes to um, I actually think hacks in the beginning of a technology's uh, life cycle is really important because the more that you can see um, technologies withstand different um, different uh, attacker events, the more trust users can have that those kind of events, um, that basically all the edge cases of, of, a, uh, of a technology are covered. So it might actually just come down to time for e these kind of events to occur, for people to become more familiarized. Um, as I was doing a little bit of Googling during the, the, during the session, it's interesting no to know that zero knowledge proofs were an idea that was implemented and introduced back in 1989. And it's through time, it's through the, the dissemination of that idea and that concept that we're here today talking about it for its application in blockchain. Um, so I think I think part of it is also giving this this application just time to build trust and go through different uh, different events, historical events. And you know sort of speaking of that right so obviously logic on chain is, is tough. The other one is regulatory compliance which hasn't always been the favorite topic of the blockchain community. Is the time right now for regulatory compliance? You know, it depends on the use case and it depends on 
what yeah it depends on the use case so if you're doing something that's more simple if you're doing something that's more company to company that's going to be easier to handle and get past the lawyers i know <laughs> when i worked at usaa i'd be like this is a, such a cool idea and we're in the innovation lab building this and then it like works its way up to legal and then it goes back down so <laughs> it's definitely a challenge i think it is the time for certain uh use cases that go international a lot of ones that involve uh, money a lot of stuff with DeFi. Uh, to have regulation around that and that part of that is to protect people uh, because you know in the end it really does help to have a regulatory body who can monitor these things without being too intrusive and I hope there's a balance that's struck there because I, I'm not on the side of there being no regulation um, when it comes to certain mainnet activities uh, that enterprises are using however there shouldn't ever be censorship or direct interference of the main net, this should be on the layer two. This should be on how you're using it, not the system itself. So it's it's a complicated area. Um, I do not claim to be an expert in regulation. Uh, I know the phrase GDPR and I feel pretty smart. So um, yeah, that, that's what I'd say about that. Christine? Yeah, I, I, really think that one of the interesting points of the discussion that we the panel that we just had of, of all these um, really talented individuals was the idea of a compliance officer of somebody who would be able to have access to that information but this person would be a trusted um it, it, it wouldn't be everybody on the chain but uh, a set designated personnel and I think one of the, the fears that, or one of the concerns there might be around bringing in this topic of regulation and talking about compliance is, does this also introduce the potential for more centralization on a decentralized blockchain? And I think that is one of the reasons why uh, there could be kind of a, a negative initial response to even bringing up this topic of regulation on the blockchain. Um, I do think though that as time moves forward and as Bitcoin, as Ethereum becomes a lot more uh, known in the general public, it's going to be impossible not to, to bring this up. And ready or not, we've already got, at least in the US, the SEC, CFTC looking at blockchain, looking at Ethereum, looking at Bitcoin, and wondering how exactly are we going to how exactly are we going to, to manage and, and govern over this thing? And I think that a lot of those rules, a lot of those laws are going to be built over time. We're not, a lot of the, the conversation that's happening now will be formative for new regulations and, and new policies that haven't even yet been created. Um, so, so I think taking an active approach in trying to understand existing regulations right now is really important, but it's also important to know that with a new technology, uh, there's likely to be new policies um, coming from regulators around it. Well, I hope we will see more research output and discussion from Coindesk on exactly this topic. Now we're about to go into the next section. I got one more question for Hudson. Hudson, there are companies that are like Dell, Microsoft, others that are really starting to take public blockchain seriously, when they think about how to get in touch with some of the core developers who are working on the underlying blockchain, or they need to understand this, what should they be doing? So, you know, if you're like someone like uh, in the C-suite, if you're someone, maybe a manager, maybe non-technical role, you're going to want to reach out to organizations like the EEA because they can, you know, put you in touch, maybe people who are involved in baseline too. On a technical level, there's chat rooms, uh, there's people like me who you can reach out to on Twitter and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, you can go into um, the core developer meetings that we have that are low level are live streamed and notes are taken. So you can view those and then start to get involved um, immediately. I know that there was a few times that Zocrates was uh, referenced which is a zero knowledge proof circuit builder, if I'm not mistaken. And it's like, I think only two people develop it. So having support from enterprises, both at a financial level and at a technical support level is gonna be very, very important as we go forward uh, because so many t uh, companies are gonna be utilizing this technology. We don't want this to turn into something like uh, OpenSSL, which 
wasn't very well funded or these other open source projects that don't get enough uh, love. So that that's, I, I think that there should be more involvement between enterprise and non-enterprise, but um, that that's just going to take time and I'm all here to help you with it. Come hit me up. Fantastic. Hudson, thank you so much. Christine, thank you very, very much. This is your last appearance, I think. And I think uh, uh, our next uh, break is just that uh, you and me at it. So Christine, thank you again for taking the time today. Hudson, see you in about an hour and a half. Thank you so much, everyone.